Hi and welcome back to the second part of the product line analysis lecture. I hope you're ready for some family-based analyses because that's what we're going to do now. First with feature mappings and for that we are going to do a quick recap of yeah what is is a typically uh, typical product line and how do we typically implement it and uh, it's usually in the field of embedded systems so we have uh, systems like uh, uh, Internet of Things or things that are embedded in routers and uh, servers and all these kinds of things where we have a huge variation of hardware and also obviously then device drivers and uh, typically we are also talking about systems programming uh, so also uh, operating system programming uh, the typical example would be the Linux kernel where we have yeah, 10,000 to 20,000 features which are all implemented basically with uh, the same technique with conditional compilation Conditional compilation, we talked about that in the fifth lecture, it consists of uh, two big parts, two tools which we usually use. First of all, the build system and also the preprocessor. With the build system, we can, uh, for example, cable, with a, which is a specific kind of make file, we can try to uh, annotate each file in our implementation and say which files are included for which features and which are maybe uh, excluded. And we can do this at a coarse granularity, but we can also have a fine granularity by using, for example, the C preprocessor. And the C preprocessor then allows us to annotate each line in our files. Um, so we have a big granularity um, for specifying which code should be included in which products and which should be excluded. The Typical problem with these kinds of implementation techniques is that the feature traceability is only implicit. So what is feature traceability? Small recap. This is about uh, tracing back our features from the feature model into the implementation or the other way around. So uh, typically you have a feature model, something like this with two optional features. And uh, these features might be associated with some C files or C++ or whatever programming language you're working with. And uh, maybe this line in this file is associated with this feature. And maybe in this file, there might be also several associated um, uh, features. And um, now we are interested in the feature mapping. The feature mapping is basically these arrows between the, the feature model, so the problem space, and the implementation. So this is the solution space. And um, this is what we're now interested in in analyzing. And this is typically not trivial for conditional compilation because uh, this kind of uh, traceability is only implicit. So we have uh, possible, possibly some kind of code scattering. For example, this feature may also occur in this file and then it's, it is scattered over two files. But we can also have tangling. So this file includes um, two features. So it is tangled between these two features. And um, it's not always trivial to, to uh, understand how this all works out. And um, so we might be asking some questions about this feature mapping. For example, we could have one kind of code location, a file or a line in a code, and ask whether this code is even included in any product. We can also ask whether there are some preprocessor annotations, if you remember these if def annotations, um, which may be contradictory or even unnecessary so that you can just leave them away. And we might also ask about statistics, uh, about code scattering and code tangling, how scattered is our code, how tangled is our code, and maybe also other questions. So I'm going to show you this at the typical example, which we use the graph product line. The graph product line, as always, includes a graph root feature and uh, always consists of nodes and edges. And the nodes can optionally be colored. And the edges can be directed, undirected, or hyper edges. Now, these hyper-edges, hypergraphs is a new concept, which I'm showing you at this example. Usually, you are probably uh, familiar with edges that connect two kinds of nodes. So, for example, this one connects V2 and V3, and then we draw a line to signify the edge. Um, however, sometimes you have applications where there's, uh, it's useful to connect more than two nodes with each other with one edge. For example, here we have V3, V6, and V5, and these are all connected basically with one big edge. And because it's hard to draw, you usually just draw these kinds of clouds um, to visualize hypergraphs. And as you can also already see, there's no direction in this edge 3, so this hypergraph 
and uh, all the other edges. So this hypergraph is undirected and this might uh, also make sense for many applications. There might also be directed hypergraphs, but uh, in this specific feature model, this is actually forbidden. So hypergraphs should always be undirected and as always, no graph can be directed and undirected at the same time. And also we have a somewhat arbitrary limitation that uh, each graph should be the directed graph or a hypergraph. Now, we would like to analyze uh, this uh, code snippet here. And this code snippet implements this graph product line with the uh, C++ programming language and with the C preprocessor. So we have nodes, we have edges, each node has a label and some nodes have colors depending on whether the colored feature is chosen. And similarly, a little bit more complex for the edge, we have different cases. One case is that we have directed edges there. We have a starting node, a from node, and also a pointing node, a to node. But we can also have hypergraphs. And in the undirected case, the hypergraph in hyperedge just is a set of nodes which are connected in some way. In uh, principle, we can also consider directed hypergraphs, and in that case, we might uh, implement this as a map from uh, some node to a set of other nodes, or the other way around. Uh, it's not so important here, but uh, in principle, this might some be something that you can also implement. And you can also take care of the case that uh, directed is not chosen, so probably we are in the undirected case, and in the undirected case we don't care about the from node and to node, it's just some pair and we don't care about the order. Okay, so um, we have implemented it this way. Maybe you can already see that this if diff here is a little bit clunky and uh, hard to understand, and we now introduce a, a helpful uh, concept to analyze this in a bit more automated fashion. It's a presence condition. So what we are going to do now is we're going to associate each line here with one formula um, that describes the circumstances under which this line is included in the product. So we can just start with this. And uh, for example, this class node line here, this is always included because it is not the it's not itself part of any if def. So we can just say, uh, the presence condition is true, and this t just means true. Also, the label is always included, so it also has the presence condition true. However, these three lines are only included when the colored feature is selected, so the according propositional formula would just be the feature colored. <clears throat> and we can go on and also do this for, for the edge, and now it gets a little bit more complicated because this, these if defs here are um, nested, so we have a different set, if def inside another if def, and we also have elif def and else, so we have a kind of uh, else in this uh, statement. So uh, still the edge is true, but this thing here is directed, and now in this elif def, we say that okay, now we're not directed anymore because it's an else if basically, and we want hyper to be selected. So the condition now is not directed and hyper, and we just abbreviate this a little for space reasons. And we can go on and fill this out and it gets just more complicated. Um, for example, this line is going to be interesting uh, later. So um, uh, the present condition of this line is this one, and it works as such. We um, had the if def directed, but now we're in the else if case. So we have that directed is not um, should not be selected anymore, but we are also in the elif diff hyper case. So hyper should be should be selected, and then we have this nested if diff here, and are in the elif diff case of this nested if diff. So undirected should be deselected, and directed should also be selected. Gets a little bit involved already in this simple example, but we can. Uh, try to build this formula this way. And this can, of course, also be automated. And to bring this to conclusion, we can continue. For example, in this else, we uh, move from the directed case to the not directed case. So this not directed is always prepended here. And of course, the last line, as it is not part of any int, uh, if def, just gets the true again. So what does this help us? Now, having these formulas, this can be really useful to uh, take care of code scattering and tangling and try to associate each line with some kind of information when it is included. 
And um, we can do this for the line presence conditions as we did right now, but we can also do this for files, for example, for the graph.cpp file. We will see this in a minute. And uh, this can now be uh, applied in several ways. One way which we can apply this is to detect dead code. So what is this? A dead code is code that is never included. Um, or you can say uh, this with uh, propositional logic. We just take the presence condition of, dead, uh, of some piece of code and see whether it is contradictory, whether it can, this present condition is a satisfiable propositional formula. When it's not satisfiable, and you can phrase this as that the presence condition implies um, falsehood, so the, uh, the upside down t is, so t is true and the upside down t is false. Um, when uh, the presence condition implies falsehood, it co contains some contradiction. And if you remember in the feature model lecture, we already did something very similar. So we can uh, copy that here and just query a satisfiability solver whether the presence condition is satisfiable or not. And when it's not satisfiable, we have dead code. We can just try this on our example. Um, for example, this first line here obviously uh, has the presence condition true. True is always satisfiable, it's a tautology even, so this is not dead code. Yeah, this, this line of code is uh, some kind of anti dead because it's uh, included in every product which is out there. Why uh, this line of code is not included in any in every product as it is a presence condition colored but it is, is at least contained in all products that uh, have colored that are colored however if we look at this map line again here we can see a little problem so the presence condition here was we were in the uh, else case elif case of this if def so um, we are in the not directed and hyper case but also we are having uh, this um, uh, this nested if def here, and are in the elif case of this nested if def, and the nested if def was undirected, so in the elif case it undirected is deselected, and directed is also selected by the if def. And if you see uh, this here, we have not directed and directed, which is pretty hard to satisfy. How can something, uh, how can the directed variable be selected and deselected at the same time? This is a contradiction. So this line of code marked in red is actually dead. And we can ask how this could happen. How could this line of code uh, be, be, uh, be dead? In this case, it's probably just uh, due to the complex if devs and nesting. So uh, uh, one who wrote this code uh, overlooked that uh, we are here trying to be uh, in the directed case but we are already by this elif in the undirected case, by this above. So uh, it was just very confusing and unfortunately C programmers have this habit of just uh, indenting all of the preprocessor lines to the left and not doing any proper indentation. Um, it could also be a, a genuine mo a domain modeling mistake. So uh, if you remember the feature model was actually uh, uh, not so positive about uh, uh, directed hypergraphs, um, but sometimes this uh, can also be intended. There was a study uh, a few years ago where uh, this was found. So sometimes developers actually disable uh, features by intention. For example, if we say, okay, the, the hyper feature, it's not uh, finally implemented. The implementation is maybe still buggy. We just uh, deactivate this and make this dead on purpose. Whatever the reason, it can be really interesting to know what kind of code is, is dead and what is not dead. Now we've seen how we can detect dead code, but if you're a little bit like me, you also want to make the code kind of beautiful and uh, remove all the cluttering stuff which is unimportant. And it can be interesting to do this and uh, detect superfluous annotations. So when is an annotation superfluous? When we can omit it without it having any consequences. And we can also try to put this formally using presence condition uh, conditions. We can take the presence condition of, a, uh, for example, a line in a file and try to look um, at the enclosing presence condition. So sometimes we have a nested if def, an inner if def, and an outer if def. And when the outer if def presence condition already implies the inner if def presence condition being like this, 
then the inner one is basically superfluous and we can just um, omit it. And we can ask uh, when we already know this uh, outer and inner presence condition PC prime and PC, we can ask a satisfiability solver about it as always, and we can just try to, uh, to make the uh, outer presence condition true while not making the inner presence condition true. And if that's impossible, so if that is not satisfiable, then the uh, inner presence condition uh, can be omitted. This is, uh, uh, we can also have a look at this in the example. And this time we're not interested in this line of code. We already know about that this line is dead. We want to look now at this line of code where we had uh, directed yeah, uh, edges and uh, whether there's a problem here and spoiler, yes, there is because we have this big if diff. It started with directed and we moved into the else case. So here we have not directed. And now in this if not def, there's an if n here. So if not def directed basically means if not directed. And uh, we are already in this not directed case. And we can also see this in the presence condition. Basically, we have not directed here and we also have it here. This seems a little bit redundant, but the actual reason why this is a redundant or superfluous annotation is that the outer presence condition, which is this one, the not directed and hyper, already implies this lower one, the inner one. And we can also have a look at them here. This is the outer presence condition, not directed and not hyper. Both are deselected. And the inner presence condition, which basically states exactly the same, only that there's another uh, uh, yeah, another unit literally here with not directed. So um, in essence, we can say that this annotation is just superfluous and we can remove it. And I guess this makes the code already a little bit better to read if we just leave off this if not def. Now we have only considered so far the presence conditions inside a single file. So the presence conditions for each line of a given file. So we have been uh, talking about the preprocessor up to now. But we also uh, can look at the build system. So the build system chooses which files are included for which feature and which aren't. And so uh, this also give ri gives rise to some presence conditions for files. And we can also consider these and uh, have to consider these because if the file presence condition is not true, then we don't even have to look at the lines because the file isn't included anyway. So in a more complex product line like Linux, this is really important that we also consider the file uh, the, uh, presence conditions. So line presence conditions plus file presence conditions. And also we still have the feature model, which is always in the background and defines which configurations are valid and invalid in the first place. And usually we want just to want to ignore any invalid configurations. For example, if there's a feature interaction in one configuration, this configuration is probably uh, or can be forbidden in the feature model. And then we don't want to consider it for the file or line presence conditions anymore. So the idea would be to not use uh, what we did up to now, not just use the product, uh, the presence condition of the line, but use the presence condition of the line in conjunction with the presence condition of the file and the formula of the feature model. And yeah, let's just do that. Yeah, we uh, already always have the same feature model. It's the same as before um, with the constraints conjoined below here. And now a uh, small change from before. We uh, Before we had one large file for implementing both nodes and edges. And now we separated these into two files, node CPP and edge CPP, to see uh, the difference between these files. And we are now trying to join all of this together and detect that code. And let's try with what we are already familiar with. We can try uh, to just take our code here, so the node uh, class and the edge class, and annotate both with their presence conditions, so the line presence conditions. And this is basically the same from the slide which I've shown you before, just uh, separated for two files. And now uh, the solution space not only consists of the lines in the files, but also of the presence conditions of the files. So I won't show you any make files here, but let's just suppose that the, the node class has 
a presence condition. So the, this file is only included when, okay, when the node feature is selected. This is a pretty simple presence condition. So especially considering that the node feature is probably a mandatory, but uh, it might also get more complex for other classes and other examples. In Linux, for example, this could also be a very complicated formula with two or three conjuncts. And also analogously, we just assume that the edge feature, that the edge class is uh, included if and only if the edge feature is selected. So, okay, we have um, line presence conditions, or we have file presence conditions now. So we uh, every, uh, um, conjoined everything that is in the solution space, but there's also still the problem space, so, which um, is modeled by the feature model. And the feature model um, also defines uh, some uh, important restrictions. For example, here below, we said that directed and undirected exclude each other. And if we don't, uh, if we just ignore the feature model and don't consider it, uh, that's an information we don't have in analyzing the source code. So it might be interesting to include this also. And it's easy. Uh, in lecture four, we saw how this can be translated into a feature model formula. And now we have this formula here. Okay, the question is, how do we do this now? Um, pretty simple. We have all of these parts and now we just have to join these parts together. And um, let's just look again at this line of code here. This line of code with the directed edges. Um, we already saw that this annotation here is superfluous, but maybe we can find out a little more. Okay, how do we do it? We have to conjoin all of these formulas. We have to take the feature model formula, which is this one, and we have to take the presence condition of the file in which the line is located, which we are interested in, and that's the, uh, the presence condition is edge for this example. And of course, we also have to take the presence condition of the actual line of code. So this is the line of code and its presence condition is this thing. And we can just substitute these. Right? This is the edge from here and this is the presence condition and this is the feature model. And now we can uh, have a look at one part of this formula, which is pretty interesting. So here we have as part of the feature model that directed or hyper should be selected. So this was this cross tree constraint, but also we have in the line presence condition that uh, it should not be the case that uh, any of them is selected. So um, uh, directed should be deselected and hyper should also be deselected because uh, we are in the else case of this if def, so directed should be deselected. And we are also in the uh, else case of this, um, this elif from, from the hyper. So uh, here was hyper was selected, but here it is not selected anymore. So both have to be deselected. And that basically means that we have a contradiction, right? Because uh, here we say on the on one hand um, that uh, directed or hyper should be selected. On the other hand, we say that neither directed nor hyper should be selected. So this code, this line of code here is dead after all. It cannot be selected in any product. And we couldn't have found this if we hadn't included uh, the uh, file presence condition and especially the feature model because this uh, was the actual problem that caused this. So joining the problem and solution space can be uh, an interesting idea. And uh, this also generalizes to other analyses of the feature model, uh, the mapping from feature model to solution space that it's uh, sometimes necessary to um, also use the feature model formula. Well, this was all kind of complicated. If you thought about it, we have to extract, uh, to analyze all of this variability, we had to extract line presence conditions. We also have to extract file presence conditions. We have to conjoin all of this together and so on. And uh, one might ask, isn't there not a simpler way to do this? And uh, there is. There is if you choose another implementation technique. So up to now, we talked about preprocessor and build systems, so conditional compilations, but you could also uh, try to think of other implementation techniques. So if you remember in uh, lecture five, six, and seven, we uh, talked about many techniques. One of these was feature-oriented programming. So um, in feature-oriented programming, we had uh, feature modules and each feature corresponded to one module. That was the key idea. So. Uh, let's look at this example. It's a bit different. We have a store, a store for some data. This data uh, can be, uh, this uh, store can be a single store or multi-store, so it can store just one datum or maybe several data. 
and uh, it can also have an access control so uh, that not any anybody can access the store and we can translate this into a feature model formula and the feature model formula yields four valid configurations only single store only multi-store and then both also with the access control control pretty straightforward and we can now implement this with feature oriented programming and we can just take the single store and implement it as one module and we can take the multi-store and implement it also as one module and the access control also and uh, the base feature is basically this uh, this single store here and uh, the multi-store then uh, refines the uh, the base uh, uh, feature for example this read method here uh, is, is basically overridden it does not return the values but uh, returns the first value and it also adds a new method the read all method and in the access control feature we actually use the super keyword to uh, call in the read method the, uh, the origin method which may be uh, the read method of the single store or possibly also be the read method of the multi-store now the question is does this example contain some dead code are there superfluous annotations how can we answer this questions um, remember that in feature modules we have a one-to-one -one feature mapping and we are analyzing the feature mapping right now so each feature corresponds to exactly one module here one layer or collaboration if you want to use these terms and this makes the analysis pretty trivial because uh, any code in this module is dead if and only if this feature is dead and we know how to detect dead features from the fourth lecture we can just uh, take the, the feature model formula which might be phi and try to select the feature f I suppose that this feature is called f and if that's not possible then it's a dead feature okay so dead code detection is really pretty easy for feature-oriented programming because we can just take the feature model uh, and uh, detect its dead features and we don't have to uh, take care of any presence conditions because of this really um, ambitious modularization which we did um, yeah so we could also maybe ask ourselves if there are uh, superfluous annotations I mean, uh, it's a hard question because there are no annotations in this implementation, but there may be something analog analogous. So um, in the feature model, uh, we usually have these constraints below here and sometimes constraints may be redundant. And maybe that's a kind of analogy to superfluous annotations because redundancies in the feature model are usually also something that we might want to remove. So um, as we can see here, uh, how difficult the analysis is, also depends on the implementation technique and uh, this can also be implemented with tool support um, for example in feature IDE we also have these feature mapping analyses um, we can uh, have a look at this example we have uh, antenna so it's java code with a preprocessor directives here is an if for hello and there's always also this int, uh, end if and now here we have an example where actually this uh, if is a contradiction and causes a dead code block so um, this is marked with a small warning sign uh, so basically feature id in the background uh, takes all of your code and uh, expresses each line as a presence condition and checks this presence condition together with the feature model here conjoined together um, whether this is actually satisfiable or not and can tell you about any problematic yeah, problems and also of course feature ID can do more than what we showed here so it can also generate your products and so on and this is also only just one tool there are many other tools available that have similar functionalities and usually this just relies on satisfiability solving now um, it's pretty nice what we've done so far we can now identify certain anomalies in our source code of our product line implementation for example we can find dead code so code which is never used which has maybe been implemented by mistake or maybe uh, even an error in the feature model on the uh, example before with the hypergraph we could just have reduced or removed this constraint because it's maybe just a uh, yeah a dumb constraint which should not occur in the model 
we can find mistakes which we make in these uh, in these annotations and we can also find disagreements between the problem and solution space so what i told you before that there uh, the feature model may might say something entirely different about your products than the actual code and we can find these kinds of disagreements however we uh, so far only analyze the mapping of the features and ignore the actual code so we haven't looked at runtime uh, bugs we haven't looked at logical bugs we haven't basically looked at the uh, uh, the actual message plus equals hello here uh, which of course is nice on one side because it's language in independent everything i told you so far works for c plus plus it also works for java it works for uh, haskell or whatever your uh, language of choice is but of course, we can just find very simple anomalies like this. Now, the difficulty of the feature mapping analysis also depends a little bit on what you're doing. Um, it typically depends on the feature traceability and therefore also on the implementation technique. We've now seen one hard example and one simple example. Conditional compilation was pretty hard because feature traceability is implicit and uh, not that good. And feature-oriented programming, for uh, feature-oriented programming, it was really easy because uh, this uh, technique by construction focuses really hard on modularization. You can guess what, uh, how hard such feature mapping analyses would be for other techniques such as aspect-oriented programming or uh, maybe um, uh, components, frameworks, and so on, or runtime variability. Okay. To summarize this part, um, by performing feature mapping analyses and also implementing them and all of these uh, de determining these presence conditions and so on, you can maybe improve upon the problems of code scattering and tangling. So remember, uh, in the fifth lecture, we said that preprocessors have this problem, yeah, code scattering and tangling, and also runtime variability sometimes also has the pro this problem if you're not using design patterns, and um, these analyses can help a little bit because we can build two support uh, which tells us where is our code scattered, how is it tangled, and uh, maybe we can find places that are very scattered and clean them up a little or something. So um, obviously this means that uh, feature mapping analyses aren't that necessary if you have a good feature traceability. So for some techniques it's not even necessary. That's uh, also something you can consider when you choose the implementation technique for a product line, um, how much effort you are planning to invest in the analysis. Okay, and uh, what's a little bit of a limitation is that uh, these uh, feature mapping analyses cannot really detect any actual logic bugs in the code. And that's something we're going to look at further in the next part. As always, there's some further reading and um, we can, you can uh, have a look at this practical task. So I just gave you the presence conditions before. So I had the file and just told you, okay, the, the logical formulas are like this and like that. Now the question is, uh, usually you want to automate this and don't you do it all yourself. How can you maybe automatically uh, extract presence condition from some C preprocessor code? And what problems might occur there? So uh, maybe look, go back to the preprocessing lecture um, where we uh, talked about problems of the preprocessor in general, and then you might have an idea what, uh, what problems might occur and how this is a, a non-trivial engineering task. And if uh, you want to, you can also think about build systems and how we can extract presence conditions for build systems, uh, as for example, for the k-build make files, which we also uh, showed to you in a past lecture. So um, have fun with this and I yeah, look forward to see you in the last part of the lecture.